Welcome to Porch Play Chat, sponsored by the American Association for Promoting the Child's Right to Play, or more affectionately called IPA USA. IPA USA is the USA affiliate of the International Play Association. As part of our efforts to promote play, we're happy to introduce our Porch Play Chats. These are conversations that focus on a wide range of topics with experts that are just as passionate about play as we are. You can find the latest Porch Play Chats and learn more about IPA USA by visiting our website at ipausa.org. And if you click in that top right-hand corner, you'll have access to our Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channel. One Porch Play Chat is released every Monday on the YouTube and Facebook pages. I'm Deb Lawrence, and I'm president of IPA USA. And with us on, with me on the porch is Lisa Murphy, a board member and an expert on play. Hi, Lisa. Hello. I'm not on the porch today because it's oh. gardener day and I'm having a wicked allergy attack. So oh. um, <laughs> just so you know, because usually I'm right outside and that's where I prefer being, but I didn't want to be sneezing all over everybody today. <laughs> and, and her porch is beautiful and mine is fake. So... <laughs> I'm in Philadelphia, so it's a little chilly out there and not not suitable to the porch. <laughs> With us on the porch is Rixa, Rixa Evershed, and Rixa has been in the early care and education profession for over 20 years. She started as a family child care provider, and then she moved into center-based care, where she's worked with all ages but found her home with infants and toddlers, so we love you for that. Her purpose is to give back to younger teachers, providing spaces for our future educators to learn and grow that will lead to all young children, regardless of their background, having access to high quality early learning experiences. So Rixa, that's amazing. And we love you for that. And so Rixa is gonna talk to us today about allowing children freedom of choice in their play and what that looks like. So, what I want to ask you is why is it important for children to be able to play as they wish? <laughs> well, I mean, as adults, we like to do what we wish, right? Why should children be any different? I And that's the end of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. Right. <sighs> it's, it's so interesting how um, we view children as less capable than we are as adults mm -hmm. and I run into this with teaching staff all the time where they view their job as constantly having to be on and having to to teach and I discovered that um, children are fully capable researchers all by themselves they don't they don't need anything but support and facilitation and by facilitation I, I like to explore the idea of observing a child seeing what they're interested in and then providing materials you know giving them that stuff that they can't go get on their own so an example might be you see a child playing with ramps and hot wheels cars I had this just happen the other day and so they're running this car off of everything, right? And and so instead of viewing that as a behavior that needs to be redirected or, or changed, give them the support and the materials to investigate that schema, to, to really dive into what they're learning about right there. And so I, you know, I, I simply gave these kiddos masking tape and big long strips of cardboard left them alone you should have seen what they did they had these amazing ramps built and and when they weren't working or falling apart you know they may ask me a question like why is it doing this and you know so my role is to simply ask them questions back to point out the the pieces that that they needed to see in order to make it work but i it's not my job to give them the answer you know mm -hmm. so that's, that's really, when I think of children being given access to just the ability to learn and the ability to play, it's, it's about not imposing what I think mm -hmm. they should know. It's about my 
learning from them what they want to learn about. And so that's, that's where I really see my role as being. And sometimes that means I'm just sitting on the floor in the same area that they're at mm -hmm. watching. And, and that's my job. That's, that's, that's all I have to do in that space. And I, I, it's, it's interesting to, to switch that paradigm for teachers of constantly having to be doing and, 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 you know, pushing the next thing on the schedule and, and giving them permission to just sit and just to be and, and however long that, that is, is okay. I have found that as that teachers, um, and, and I, I say that word loosely, I, I think that when we break up with calling ourselves teachers, I love how you said facilitator. Um, I, I've often said in sessions that, you know, if I'm talking to people outside of the profession, sometimes it's easier just in a quick conversation to say, you know, I'm a teacher, early childhood person, you know, blah, 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 get on with the, the story. But with people in the profession, facilitate, facilitate, facilitate. I broke up with calling myself a teacher a long time ago because I think when we stay so locked on the teacher model, it still brings up what I call that mug jug theory, right? Like I'm the biggest one in the room. I got all the knowledge. There's my big old jug and I crack open your head and I pour it in. And, and I think the word teacher, even the most play-based spirit of us, the word teacher, I think keeps us stuck in that, in that model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I think, you know, <sighs> I don't, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole, but we fought for so long for recognition for our field uh -huh. that that moniker of teacher gives us, yep. gives us um, gravitas, right? Uh -huh. But at the same time, if we look at learning, it's, it's a lifespan thing. It, it doesn't stop when you turn 18. It doesn't stop when you graduate from college, right? You're, my mom said the other day, oh God, I love my mom. She's like, I'm 78 years old, Rixa. At some point, can I stop learning life lessons? <laughs> and she was being facetious, but at the same time, it really just hit home that, that in a classroom, like we're still learning too. Like it's a learning space. And the minute we think that we have all the knowledge, then we need to get out of that space because we've effectively put up a giant brick wall to our, our ability to be um, competent in, in that space and to be um, a part of a learning community. Rick, so one of the things that I, I, I think is, is preventing teachers from feeling that um, feeling that purpose of being in a classroom is that there's they because they don't know what they're seeing mm -hmm. and they may not understand what's happening mm -hmm. they get bored mm -hmm. right because it's not I remember and and so I'll I'll tell stories about me I remember when I was an infant teacher now that was long ago in a land far far away I would just <laughs> like wow babies are so boring uh, mm -hmm. You know, I love them and I want to rock them and I talk to them and I was doing all the right things, but I wasn't seeing the development that was happening and, and understanding how to scaffold that development by, by maybe putting a toy a little bit out of their reach, but not, you know, teasing them by continuing to move it, you know, so <laughs> I know it's like, oh, stop it. What are you doing? But, you know, I, so sometimes I think early educators feel like because of that stigma being, you know, babysitters and not having the respect that we deserve, feel like they have to be doing something. So how do we get them out of that space and get them to see what children are doing and the development that is happening right before their eyes? So that oh, they I'd have the answer. Play, 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 play. <laughs> For long but periods when we, of time. When we start to see that play is important and play is Absolutely. crucial and me as a facilitator, right, of that play within that space, like Rexa is saying, then I see that what I'm doing is enough. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting. I, 
when you were talking about being in an infant room, I was remembering. So, you know, as teachers, we all have those kind of aha moments where our, our development moves to a new level. Mm -hmm. And I was in an infant room in Alaska and, you know, Alaska goes through a period of darkness, especially in Fairbanks. Um, Mm -hmm. so (laughs) in about April, the sun would start to come back in the windows of the classrooms that were on the, the North side of the building. And, um, so there were willows outside the building windows. And so the sun is still pretty low on the horizon, um, low relative, you know, but Mm -hmm. um, it came, comes through the window and on the floor was the shadow of the willows, right? And we were going about all the things that we do, changing diapers, feeding. Mm -hmm. And I was changing a diaper and I looked over this little, this little lady was on the floor on her belly. Um, you know, she's doing the, the worm crawl that they do. And um, she had stopped. And, you know, as teachers, we have to be observers because I, I was like, huh, I wonder why she stopped. That was a question I asked myself. And then I could see that she was investigating the shadow of the moving willow on the tile floor and so that was one of those moments where and I had just finished reading Alison Gopnik's um, The Scientist in the Crib mm-hmm. and I talk about an impactful book that mm-hmm. that was one of the mm-hmm. ones but to to then connect what I had just read about to what I was seeing happening with that child on the floor and to just not interrupt that and say oh do you see the branch or whatever just to let her be um and you know what a moment for her but also knowing that I can now take what she just learned and facilitate other experiences with shadow and light and and all of the things to to kind of build on that but also to do it in a way that that is a space for her to discover those things um, by just giving her the materials to do that. And I think so often, especially in infant and young toddler rooms, we get bogged down in what should be, right? Because they are into everything. They're climbing everything. They're putting everything in their mouths. And and so how do we create spaces for them where, where they can authentically engage with the materials? And as Tiffany and I were just talking about last night, as a matter of fact, yes, classrooms, right? Mm-hmm. Creating those yes classrooms where they can investigate safely and they can investigate real materials, mm-hmm. not the stuff that comes out of a catalog, but the stuff that they'll find in their homes and outside and places like that. Absolutely. And I, th- I think the other, the big aha moment that we need to really key in on what you just said is that you don't need to interrupt them to explain something, right? <laughs> Stop making everything a teachable moment. Like, leave it alone. <laughs> leave it alone. I, and, and, you know, the other thing that uh, what I have seen often in infant and toddler rooms, and I have to tell you, I had to hold myself back with grandchildren is, you know, you got this new fun little thing for them to investigate and not wanting to show them how it works, right? I truly had to hold my hands behind my back. And I, and I mean, I, I have the doctorate, right? So I, I know better. I know it was, things. <laughs> I, it was hard. It was hard to allow them that freedom to investigate and without any interference from me. And, and so I, you know, I think that's another lesson for teachers that let it go for a while, see what's happening. Don't because, well, and that can be a scary spot to sit in, right? Which is that depending on the Kool Aid I've been drunk, drinking or who's been force feeding me certain kinds of Kool Aid, if if I'm still locked and loaded on that, you know, top down model, and I don't know where this might go, uh, you know, that that that. How, how close, how willing are we to come to that, to that feeling like we're losing control, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, I don't know where this might go. So how comfortable am I with letting that unfold on its, on its own? Mm-hmm. I, Rick, I want to jump in and say something. Um, I attended a conference a hundred years ago that was so exactly what you were just describing. And the presenter said, as teachers, 
you, part of our job is that you have to notice that they noticed. So having now some exploration of light and shadow because you noticed that she noticed how much more relevant and real and meaningful than, you know, because it's, it's, it's shadow week, right? Or it's, it's S, it's S week. Okay. The theme okay. is light. You know? Oh. <laughs> I know. So, oh. authentic. So, so authentic. Which may not have any relevance to the child when the theme is light, right? But at that moment, the theme is light because she has decided that that's what we're going right. to investigate this week. And I think giving, um, credence to the idea that as a nine month old she can direct her own learning mm -hmm. well and I, it goes back to you know i always reference bev boz all the time because the child is the curriculum if you just observe the child they'll tell you everything you need to know about what that child is interested in and how you can provide experiences that allow them to uncover what it is they're interested in instead of covering it as Lillian Katz says, you need to uncover a topic, not cover it. And so, you know, all those wonderful nuggets that should help early care and education professionals feel more comfortable in their facilitation role is where I hope we can lead this next generation of teachers. But I think it's gonna take more work. And so what are some ideas you have about how to support teachers in a classroom and scaffold their learning based on what they may be interested in understanding more about? Do you have any insights to that? <laughs> Well, you know, I, I also attended a conference. It wasn't quite a hundred years ago, but I mean, it was at Boulder Journey School. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. And the topic that they really unpacked at that particular con conference was leaning into the dissonance. Mm. And I really appreciated that because I had been doing my own work with um, a friend of mine. Um, her name is Robin. She has a uh, program in Massachusetts but we talk about when learning is kind of right here like we're we're actively in our process of learning so we're constantly bumping up against that wall of fear and the unknown and all of the pieces that go because if you're not failing if you're not scared you're not learning my cat <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> I have four so I understand <laughs> and so you know being in a position of or, or in a space, a culture within a center or within a employer where um, being okay to take those risks within your own practice and to really unpack what, what you don't feel competent at um, and try new things. I think it's so multi-layered. So you can have a teacher who's all kinds of willing to take these risks and do these things and really explore these new ideas. Um, but if the culture of the program doesn't support her mm -hmm. or him, then she's going to, they're going to fail. Um, and so I think that it's, it's multi-layered. And so I've always, as a director, I've always tried to promote instead of risk adverse, I really want to be excellence achieving. And if you're going to be excellence achieving, then you have to give teachers space to fail. You have to give them space to try new things and you have to be willing to sit in that space of dissonance with them, both as a supporter and as a co-learner. Like we wanna be learning this together. And um, you know, the, the learning wall that Robin and I were talking about is very much about, um, you know, sometimes you move away from it, it moves out and you're, you're now sitting in a space of comfort again, where you have gained competence and fluency with an idea with a practice. And so you, it's okay to sit in that space for a little while, right? And to mm -hmm. take a breath and to, to kind of rejoice and find joy in, in this new learning that you have. Um, but then you can't stay there. You have to continue to, to bump up against that wall of learning if you want to create what we think of as, you know, these amazing learning spaces for children. 
Um, because if you're not actively learning, then they're probably not actively learning either because there's a, a kind of a layer of stagnant that kind of falls in there. And so um, I think when you're in a culture um, that promotes like that excellence achieving idea, um, then you're, you're pushing each other. You're, you and your colleagues are, oh, I saw this, I, I read about this, or um, I uh, heard this idea, or this, I listened to a porch chat the other day, you know, and they were talking about this. I really want to dive into that a little bit, um, you know, with with each other. And so you have this this opportunity with your colleagues to really um, push each other. And to if you bump up against that learning wall, then you're there to support each other. If you're sitting in that space of comfort, maybe a colleague kind of bumps you out of it, you know. So um, I I really think it, ultimately it comes down to you have to, we have to support each other and lift each other up. We have to, to really wrap each other in, in, uh, I got you if you fail and, mm -hmm. you know, having each other's back. And I had a really, um, amazing, um, administrator at, uh, up in Alaska who said to me, he said, you can make the hall of fame with a batting average of 300. And so when you think about, you know, it's a sports analogy, but it makes so much sense to me because, Perfect is a thousand, right? You can make the Hall of Fame at three hundred. So you had to explain that. I had no idea what you were talking about. There, there's <laughs> some sports. I'm like, okay, please clarify this so I don't have to say something. <laughs> yeah. So less than fifty percent, and you can still make the Hall of Fame. And really, what it what it um, relates to for me is just put yourself out there. Just try. You know, just just challenge yourself. Just get excited about stuff and and bring that to the classroom you know because well well the children are in the classroom and the children are the ones that we're facilitating for but aren't we there too and, and don't we bring our heart and our joy and our passion to the classroom also and so i think for for teaching stuff i that's one of the things i try to always give but also to receive from them is to be willing to be pushed and and challenged in my own thinking and my own learning and all the things. So, that so you to know, I'm interrupting. I okay. want to know if you've written a article about that leaning, that process of the leaning into the learning wall and sitting in that space of, of what you said, like hanging out there for a little bit, right? Kind of that, oh, that, and, and to me, the first word that jumped in my head when you were talking about that was like, I need to recalibrate, right? So yeah. I, I, I need to recalibrate to this being my new normal mm -hmm. before I take another challenge, right? So I don't fall down that slippery slope of going back, right? Cause we know that we're gonna go back to what we knew first, right. unless we continue to do the work. We're gonna, when we get tired, when we get burnt out, when we get frustrated, we're gonna go back to the way we, oh, but I changed my mind. So <laughs> I think there's, we, we need to remember that. It's, it's, it's okay to sit here for a little bit. Yes. And don't get stuck. And Rixa, I want to know if you've unpacked that in an article. Yes, because no, I, I'm not. <laughs> but I'm hearing that you might want me to. Yeah, I think that. Yes. I, well, I, I, I could actually see you doing a workshop on it. I think as uh, people in this profession, anytime we can learn uh, another way of processing the changing of our mind and the evolution and the being gentle with our former selves and how maybe we used to do it. But the more we continue to clarify our values, the more we're going to be willing to reflect on our practice. And, and the cycle of change can be really scary, especially if you feel like you're the only one in your program who's doing it. It sounds like you are creating spaces where everybody is kind of collectively on that journey of looking at where can we still continue going bumping up against that wall and i just i think that it would be a very very valuable workshop topic and a very valuable article um so <laughs> i'm i'm serving in return and i'm tossing that back to you <laughs> okay i got it okay and i'm gonna give you one more i'm gonna give you one more because i think as a um in a leadership role yeah I think directors feel so pressured uh -huh. by what they have to accomplish that they don't feel like they can give their staff this space 
to try things out because they have to do what's, you know, what's required by NAYC or what's required by the QRIS or what's required by state licensing or what's required, you know. And so I feel like directors, you need to do one for teachers of sitting there in that space, but you need to do one so that directors feel like they can provide that space for teachers and also to take that space for themselves. Yes. Yes. So, you know, child care information exchange is the perfect place for this, I think. Um, I'm sure there are others. Do you have any others, Lisa? But I oh, think I would say exchange. That's that's a yeah. good definitely. That's you know, that's what that's the trade magazine for early care and education. So that's where I think you could get the most bang for your buck in that. The other thing I like about this, Rixa, and I, I know I'm taking it a little off topic, but this is where my, this is how this works, <laughs> is the scaffolding there from peer to peer, right? From teacher mm -hmm. to teacher. Um, and that it's not always on the shoulders of the administrator in order to facilitate that space, but that as people working together, we can do that for each other. And I, I, I like that. It's reminding me of, mm -hmm. you know, how Vygotsky was honoring that peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer, right? It doesn't always have to come the scaffolding from the adult or the biggest or the tallest or the most experienced. It could come from somebody the same age who's just approaching the situation with a different set of eyeballs and mm -hmm. is able to assist each other. I like that piece. You know, it's, it's interesting in, I've worked in so many different styles of programs and um, I was talking again to Tiffany last night and we were talking about where I am currently and how I don't fit there anymore because my practice, but that's where I started is in that model of program. And it really didn't hit home for me until I moved out of it and was able to facilitate a pedagogy and a model that was very, very different from that, but lent itself more to, you know, the way I grew up. I grew up with, my dad was an art teacher, my mom was an artist. Um, and so I always had that open-ended, like they were constantly like, yeah, go do it, you know, try it, you know? And so that was really kind of where I grew up and it, it really brought home why I was not successful as much in my early experiences with, um, early childhood education. And it wasn't until I um, got some amazing women in my life who just really supported and validated my thought process that I was able to really say, okay, I, I am, this is like an okay thought process, you know, being play-based and child directed and all the, all the things that we now know are so, but 20 years ago, that knowledge wasn't even out there mm -hmm. that, that play-based, I mean, it was new. It was like this, this, and maybe I just wasn't in a space where it was circling around me, but it was, um, you know, and the more you read and the more you, you investigate and then the, the more you see like this information that you're being given is actually, you, you see children finding success within that model. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then being able to see that, you know, you don't need to give sight words to a four-year-old mm -hmm. that they're going to learn to read regardless. However, if you give sight words to a four-year-old, they may learn to hate reading in the process. And um, so I just, I, I've noticed that within our profession, we have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. We really do to get, to get play, play embedded and recognize as the valuable curriculum that it is. And, it, it, and, it, and, I, and I think Rissa, that's so important because I think the other, the other thing that we are challenged with is that what, what does this lens of play-based look like? Because I've had kindergarten teachers and preschool teachers tell me, oh yes, we play. I, every 15 minutes they rotate to a new station and I'm like, okay, so that's okay. not play. And, <laughs> and, you know, oh, well, you know, we have to do art and then we have to do math and then we have to do science and then I, and that's not play. And, and so, you know, I think it's the, it, it's helping them understand what play based is, is. and and how to, you know, again, well, you know, I have to do all these assessments and I have to, you can assess children by watching them and observing 
what? I, what? <laughs> you mean I don't have to give them the blocks and say, build me the tallest tower? Well, you, uh, I'm like, and through oh that, I got to interrupt. <laughs> if, <laughs> and we've unpacked this on the podcast too, is that the reason at the core, and, and, and I don't know if, if we just don't want to admit it, is if, if we are 100% play-based, it's not going to make anybody any money. Like we stop putting money in big education and big catalog, right? Cause you don't need all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And at some point we got to realize that you don't need to buy all those assessments. You don't need to buy all that crap in the catalog. You don't need any of it. And we, because we drank the Kool-Aid of thinking that you did, right? Because we got the cure, the rating scale and you have to have five identifiable interest areas. Rah, 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 rah. But, but you don't, you don't. You don't. You don't. I, uh, it's, it's super, it's super interesting when you have those conversations. Cause I, I, that, that brought up so much for me, but I also think just to unpack a little bit more is that if you are strictly play-based, then the children have control of the classroom mm -hmm. and that's a very scary place to be. If mm -hmm. you don't have experience with facilitating inside of that type of a classroom so the secret to good teaching is controlling the environment instead of the children yes yeah. that guides that has when i first heard that you were like oh what's that huh you know and that's why i tell my audiences i don't want you doing anything new or different for 10 days i want you mm -hmm. thinking i want you sitting in this space yeah. business as usual with just maybe a little lens shift. Like, oh my gosh, how often I didn't even realize that I am trying to control the 12 little guys in this room. What if I started putting that same energy into controlling the space instead of the children? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden behaviors go blah, 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 blah. I mean, I tell people all the time, if that's the only thing you ever remember that I've said, and then think about it, Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to be just fine, but you are 100%. The control piece is like, it's the first thing you got to be willing to get rid of. And realizing that by shedding the control does not mean that the kids are running around naked with paint flying through the air, like <laughs> Lord of the Flies in room five, you know, because that's what everybody thinks. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like that's, that's it. I'm either controlling David or it's anarchy and chaos. And you're like, mm, actually, not yeah. really, not really. It's, it's interesting to watch a truly competent play-based teacher too, because if you walk into their classroom and you don't know what you're seeing, you could potentially view it as sort of chaotic because you have a child over on one side loading up the grocery cart with, if there's a grocery cart, which I hope there's not in the classroom, but you know, or the big box with all the blocks from the block area and they're hauling it clear across the classroom to the rug where the community meeting happens in the morning, right? And, and they've got um, all of the um, accessories and loose parts from dramatic play, they're, that's all in there too. And, you know, and even as I talk, I'm hearing myself say these like center areas, well, they're not even really needed. I, I think that, you know, I, and, and I think having a place where you can play house, I remember as a little girl, like mm -hmm. I would have loved to have had a place where I could play house or whatever, you know, struck my fancy at that time, but it, it's also not stuff I had and I still played house, you know? Right. So, right. Um, we don't have to give them everything. We need to allow them the creativity to create it on their own. I mean, I, it was amazing what I created underneath the fig tree outside right. that I was able to create this play scenario that I did for hours without, with a fig tree and dirt. Right. And so if somebody it, walked in, it might've looked like, Oh, there's Deb again, hanging out under that tree, you know? And, and like what you're saying, Rick, so somebody could walk in and not see mm -hmm. the value of what's unfolding organically. Mm -hmm. Right. And yeah. I think that is the, the next series of porch play chats, Rick. Says. So I want you to think about that because unfortunately we're out of time. We're out of time. I told you it goes so fast and we want to go so deep. So I'm going to close this up, but don't go anywhere. I, I'm going to close this up, but stay, <laughs> stay with us. Um, and I'll stop the recording in just a second. But um, so for more information on other porch play chats, because they're all just as good as this one, or to join IPA USA 
please visit our website at ipausa.org. I, I do want you to know that in the um, on our website page on the main um, sort of titles of what you can find there, there's a new one on playing COVID with play boards. And so I want you to go take a peek at those. Those are amazing. Um, so until next time, thanks for listening and keep on playing. Bye-bye. Bye. All right, hold on.